one thing that I, I'd like to ask is how you got involved into psychotherapy and psychotherapy research in general. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know, so having done my, my doctoral work at, at Penn State with uh, Louis, mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite easy to be, um, uh, to sort of ha not only have interest in psychotherapy research going in, but then also to, uh, you know, catch the bug from Louis, who is very contagious. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I think I was always interested in, in relationships. And, it, you know, that was something when I approached Louis about working doing my graduate work with him, I was very interested in how relationship dynamics would manifest in, in a therapy relationship. And not just the sort of positive elements of a relationship, but also the challenges, uh, the different needs people bring into a relationship, even a, even a relatively um, different type of a relationship with like therapy, of course, is going to have uh, inherently have people negotiating different needs, yeah. um, negotiating different moods, uh, possibly having uh, conflicts, whether being overt or subtle. Um, and so I guess I was always sort of interested in the dyad and how the dyad negotiates things. Um, and I guess it wasn't long thereafter that I think my identity, my, my, I guess my two parts of my primary identity became as a psychotherapy researcher focused in on the patient-therapist relationship as well as an integrationist. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and you know, as a fellow CEPI member, I think I've, <clears throat> I think I've always been interested in this idea of clinical flexibility, and I think at some point along the way, over the last twenty years or so, um, I, I think in some ways the primary manifestation of flexibility is responsiveness. Mm -hmm. But I would I wouldn't have been able to say that um, several years back. I don't know that I would have had a name for it. I don't know that I would have had a, a model for it, but I know at some point I started reading Bill Stiles' work, yeah. and he, he put a name to it, um, and it became sort of very interesting to me, and not unlike you, um, sort of became a direction I wanted to take in my own uh, study, starting from my master's thesis through my dissertation and now into my own uh, research program. So, so maybe you can tell our listeners what, how you define responsiveness for those who don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I can first say um, what was a precursor to me wanting to define responsiveness. Yeah. And I would, you know, from day one of my training, I have been interested in the idea of evidence-based practice. But I was also um, somewhat immediately disenchanted with the notion that evidence-based practice or expertise was somehow synonymous with being adherent to a treatment package. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think treatment packages and manualization and, and, and you know, sort of system, systematization of, of interventions is important. Um, but this idea of adherence and competence and, and sort of, um, you know, somewhat following some kind of predetermined plan always uh, sort of bugged me a little bit. It didn't sit quite right. It seemed rigid in a way. Yeah, rigid or at least... Um, now we can say it, right, at least non-responsive to uh -huh. things that, that might emerge, right? And so I think it has sort of taken me a while for my own sort of thoughts and, and research agenda to kind of cohere around this construct of responsiveness, but um, hopefully I'll have some useful ideas and, and findings to share. Uh -huh. uh, and, and as we discussed before we started recording, I, I hope this will stimulate you and other people to have better thoughts and, and, and even more impressive research projects. <laughs> but to go back to your question, I mean, I think we can, when we start by, uh, when we think about responsiveness, I think it makes sense to start with uh, Bill Stiles' definition. And he's been writing on this construct for years. Um, and I think at a very broad brushstroke level, uh, responsiveness gets at participant behavior. And I think it's participant behavior that is inherently affected by things that emerge, right? Contexts that, that start to surround us that we may or may not have predicted. And again, this could be dyadic behaviors. It could be perceptions that people have of each other in the relationship of therapy, um, different needs or wishes. And it can even be more trait-like characteristics that the participants kind of bring in to the room. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what it involves is something that's always moving, <laughs> which makes it 
makes it something uh, that's kind of challenging to define and study. Um, and it's complex, right? I think it's a complex interaction among participants, and I think it can affect uh, it can affect therapy before it even begins, yeah. right? Because it could affect whether people even decide to seek treatment. Uh, it could affect preferences that patients may have for different types of therapies or therapists. Um, it could be something that's in the moment, right? Like me as a therapist saying something based on what my patient just said or did or looked like. Mm -hmm. And that could be something that's brilliant. It could also be something that's a terrible misstep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's happening because of our interaction in the moment. And it could also be something that takes place uh, across time. Um, you know, something uh, Louis and I have written about, um, you know, is, is the fact that alliance ruptures, um, you know, you could be in an active alliance rupture for multiple sessions. Or, or, you know, if you read Safran and Moran's work and Catherine Eubanks, you know, alliance ruptures can be the entirety of treatment. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so in those cases, I think it's important to be responsive um, in almost in a continuous way across time, yeah. perhaps until that rupture has been resolved to some extent um, or some kind of agreement has been reached. Um, so I think to give a, a sort of a wordy response to your initial question, I think inherent in these types of examples um, is the idea that you often as a clinician have to be responsive to something, uh, such as a, a patient diagnosis or a stated preference. And I think you also have to be responsive with something, right? And my hope is that the, the things that you, the, the interventions or the strategies that you can use when you're being responsive with something, um, can be evidence-based, they can be modular, they can plug into and out of different approaches, um, and that could be an, a, an intervention. It could be a particular stance. It could be an attempt to facilitate a corrective experience. Mm -hmm. um, I know in Lorna's presentation, you know, it could be using something like the SASB model to know that something is being pulled for right now. And, and maybe at first it's, it's, it's useful to complement it, but later you hope to change it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I sort of had the SASB model in my mind for most of my training. And I think in a lot of ways that can be helpful to, to be responsive, to yeah. understand complementarity. I remember we have an early, an early article we've been using the SASB model or talking about it. Yeah, I published an article very early on in graduate school um, applying uh, SASB to the construct of the therapeutic relationship. And uh -huh. at the Bill Henry had been doing a lot of work in the 1980s. And then sort of since then, I've, I've been a longtime admirer and collaborator with Ken Critchfield. Mm -hmm. uh, and clinically, Lorna is, since we're using the word, a hero of mine. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that model, I think, uh, comes into play quite a bit as I think about, um, you know, sort of theory of change, but also how theory of change, I think, needs to accommodate um, things that emerge in the clinical scenario or before the clinical scenario yeah. that you may or may not have planned on in your theorizing or your case formulation. Okay, so let's get into the... the dirty part of this. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the thing is, I think if you talk to any therapist, they would completely agree responsiveness is important, flexibility is important. But then yeah. you also mentioned something very important, which is there are different levels of, of abstraction we can look at when we talk about responsiveness. You can yeah. talk about like just little micro markers or entire sessions. So the big question becomes, how do you choose what to be responsive to? What are yeah, your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, my thoughts are many. I mean, I, I guess my first, my first reaction, my responsiveness to you in this interview, um, is that I'm not entirely sure that, that all or most clinicians would uh, necessarily agree with this idea. I mean, I, th I think people like the idea of flexibility, but I also think there are some clinicians um, that are drawn to the idea of, of having a very particular sequence or uh, agenda that you can follow and, and sort of a time limited sequence and, and you try to fit the, the it, you sort of fit the patient into what you're doing as opposed to fit what you're doing to what the patient needs. That being said, I think you're right. When it comes down to being behind the closed door of therapy, I think most therapists probably act more flexibly than they might theorize, <laughs> might write about, uh -huh. um, which is good. Um, and you're right. It's messy, right? Because I think uh, I, I love one of one of the ways that Bill Stiles has been talking about responsiveness uh, of late 
Um, in fact, he'll have a chapter coming out in Louis and Clara Hill's book on therapist effects. And he talks about responsiveness being uh, or it's it's doing the right thing at the right time. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, easy, easy enough, right? Make, exactly. Make, make the right thing and and know the right time. And oh, by the way, it's really really hard to measure. Um, so for me, that's it's it, it's such an elegant way to say it, and it's also terribly elusive, which makes it which makes it messy. Um, but I think this tells us it 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 leads to this notion of why probably. Uh, strictly adhering to some kind of a priori treatment plan across different patients and across different contexts predicts little to no outcome variance, right? Because you're not always using the model at the right time. Yeah. Um, and, and treatment, as you, you know, I like the word messy because treatment is nonlinear. Uh, it's often non-predictable in its course. Um, <laughs> it's, as Bill has written about quite a bit, it's often self-correcting. Yeah. And this really does pose a problem for psychotherapy research designs um, and interpretation of, of the research. And and I remember reading a paper in 1980. Uh, I read it later, but it was published in 1988. And, and Bill was really making this argument that responsiveness can obscure differences between treatments or it could explain why they're comparable. Yeah. Um, it, it could mask a possible process outcome correlation because that's based on logic that may not apply, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that more of one thing is going to lead to more or less of another. Yeah. Well, sometimes something being just really well-timed but not frequent could be more powerful clinically than doing things a lot of times. Yeah. Um, and so there may be process outcome correlations that exist that we haven't captured with a more traditional correlational design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea of self-correction could confound the meaning of dropout right? We tend to think of dropout as a bad thing. It could just be that somebody got what they needed and stopped coming <laughs> and, and, and they're perfectly happy about it. But we as therapists don't know that yeah. because maybe they didn't call us back or they didn't come back for that planned termination uh -huh. session. Uh -huh. um, so anyway, I, I, I think this is, you know, this is the beginning to the answer to your question, which is the way that I tend to think about rolling up our sleeves and, and getting in the dirt, so to speak, um, I think we can progress in at least two ways, and that's what I've been trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to uh, be more specific and theoretical and conceptual as we come up with clinical models of what responsiveness can be. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to share more, and it sounds like you've, you've done a little reading on this idea of context-responsive psychotherapy integration. So that's one, one thing I think that we can do to sort of sharpen our focus on what responsiveness is. Um, because otherwise it, it might just be everything and then it's just tautological and, you know, then it's just like, well, of course, you know, be responsive. Um, but I think we can have models that are sort of driven by uh, good theory. And then the second part is that I think we can and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the impetus for this interview was the piece that I wrote for the CEPI newsletter. I think we can study responsiveness, maybe not perfectly, uh, maybe not comprehensively enough just yet, but I think we can get there. Um, and I'll, I'd be happy to sort of lay out a couple of Please. designs later on um, that we've used to try and answer those questions. And then if you can test responsiveness or just a piece of it, um, that can feed back into your conceptual models. And yeah. so, as you know, I've been, I've been sort of working on both, um, although in terms of the research, I didn't always know that I was working on it, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then it sort of brought me to this idea of, of context responsive Mm -hmm. psychotherapy integration. So I'd, I'd be happy to say more about that or answer any other questions. But I think, you know, the idea of sharpening our conceptualization of the, of the construct and then working really hard to test it instead yeah. of just accepting that it's elusive yeah. are, are two ways that we can get dirty. I, I think anyone listening to you now really wants to know, okay, let's go to evidence-based markers. How is that? Just, yeah. just before getting into that, I really like to recommend, it's one of my favorite recent papers, your 2013 paper on context-responsive psychotherapy integration that you did with Boswell and Louie. And yeah. that is yeah. one of the beginnings of this thing we're talking about, so trying to find evidence-based markers. So Absolutely. I, I'll, let me share more about that uh, yes. for those who... Um, who haven't seen the paper, I'm glad you have. It was uh, an invitation by Jeffrey Magnavita uh, at a time when he started writing about uh, unified clinical psychology models. Um, and I guess we were initially trying to really present uh, 
this model in a unified clinical science framework. And I think we accomplished that, but it also occurred to me that we might be writing sort of about a fifth pathway to integration, right? Forever as a field, and very appropriately so, we've been talking about eclecticism, common factors, theoretical integration, and assimilative integration. And I think you'll probably see pieces of those in this model, but I think this model is a, is a slightly different um, angle, and I think it's testable. So first and foremost, uh, CRPI, I'll call it, um, it really does sort of heed the uh, literature, the research literature that does suggest, and, and I know Bruce Wampold was one of your interviewees as well, it really does suggest that common uh, trans-theoretical and often trans-diagnostic treatment factors seem to be really instrumental in promoting improvement. And, and we don't even have to get into right now whether they're more or less effective than specific factors, but I think it's undeniable that common factors play a role and, and a very substantial role. Um, one of the things that we did in our paper was we started to theorize <clears throat> in part because we wanted our work to be testable and then disseminable mm. to clinicians in a very accessible way. Uh, we started to think of common factors a little differently. So we reframed common factors as this idea of things that happen commonly, mm. right? So, <laughs> so common clinical situation that therapists encounter to which they need to be responsive in some way, whether you're doing CBT, whether you're doing psychoanalytic, whether you're doing gestalt, whatever you may be doing, emotion-focused work, um, there are going to be things that probably come up a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've already mentioned a common one, something like an alliance rupture, yeah. right? At, at some point, no matter what kind of work you're doing, you are in the context of a relationship, and that relationship could break down. Mm -hmm. The communication could break down. The agreement on what you're doing could break down. The attachment felt could break down. And the idea is um, stop just forging ahead with what you've been doing and try to respond to that in some more effective way. And so what we started to do was write about this as sort of an if-then framework. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, um, if something happens, then therapists can do this. And if we know that these things happen often and they can be reliably observed mm -hmm. based on data and we have tested modular responses to them that say when you do this thing like a, like a rupture repair intervention, this works, yeah. then we can start to lay out the sort of situation-relevant, principle-driven, and evidence-based therapeutics that could be taught in small modules, right? I can now, instead of doing yet another in service or training or uh, you know continuing education workshop on a brand name therapy mm -hmm. i could just say hey i'm going to give you a 45 minute very efficient in service on noticing alliance ruptures yeah. and using evidence based humanistic and interpersonal strategies to help resolve those ruptures before you go back to doing whatever it is you that do. you're doing so if this <laughs> happens maybe you could do that Exactly, exactly. So it's kind of an if then. Yeah. And then also we talked about there being sort of an if when. In other words, if the particular context, I'll, I'll keep using alliance rupture as an example for a moment, mm -hmm. if that gets resolved, and the relationship starts to feel like it's back on track. Well, at that moment, that when moment, you can go back to doing whatever the intervention was that you were doing, especially if the patient found it credible. Yeah. So I still I still tend to draw on Jerome Frank's work. I I think the most important part of having a specific approach in a theory, mm -hmm. which may be packaged as an empirically supported treatment, um, I think the the most important part of that is you have a rationale. Yeah. And ideally, that rationale is believed by the patient. Yeah. And if it is, you continue with it and you try to do things. To use Frank's words, you use rituals exactly. uh, or techniques that that sort of match that rationale. Yeah. And so I think you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The idea here is that specific and common factors can come together in this way, mm -hmm. and both elements can be evidence-based. You could have a treatment package, but the treatment package may not tell you much about what to do when this unexpect, unexpected sort of context or occurrence uh, comes up. And that's where this sort of modular piece uh, of, of learning how to do, in this case, a rupture repair intervention can be really, really useful. And, and I, think, I, I think we haven't tended to do those sorts of things in our trainings, um, at least not consistently so far, uh, 
uh, in our in our training programs. The, the only uh, the only way I learned or the place where I learned this if then logic was actually from Wes Greenberg from emotion focus therapy. Absolutely, that's a huge inspiration. I mean, his task analytic work on on deriving markers um, like a self split or uh, unfinished business, and then using these different types of chair work in those moments yeah, yeah. Uh, is is absolutely uh, an inspiration for this model. And and in fact, in many ways, maybe the first sort of robust research program to kind of identify markers and identify strategies for using those markers. Yeah. Of course, I think a slight difference there is that those markers and the chair work uh, still remain embedded in a very specific framework, sure. right? So, so you don't have to you don't have to leave emotion focused therapy <laughs> to do those sorts of things. In fact, I think that's a big part of what emotion focused therapy is a marker driven emotion based narrative model that has you being responsive to markers. Yeah. Um, but I think what our model is saying, you could be doing other things too, like CBT or psychodynamic or something else. Yeah. And when commonly occurring things come up, and, and I'm going to get into another one in a moment, I'll talk about resistance, but when something like an alliance rupture comes up, that you you take a moment and put your your specific strategies and your specific orientation on the shelf, and you try something else, and that something else ideally has been vetted through research yeah. uh, in the field. I, I remember, it's very interesting, because when I talked to uh, Wes Greenberg, he said that the first time they came up with task analysis and this idea of yeah. if then with his mentor Laura Rice, that they were kind of like holding this precious thing and they went to the conference and thinking it would be stolen. And for 20 years, no one took it up in other approaches. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and, and the, the uptake for me clinically was, was almost immediate. I mean, once I started reading about uh, their work um, and, and understanding this idea of, of unfinished business and, and self splits and, and, and the goals toward integration by using chair work more, more clearly, it was an easy thing to integrate into whatever clinical uh, uh, you know, approach I was using at the time. It's an easy thing to bring into supervision because it's, it's so potent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I, I and I think it plugs very neatly into CRPI. In fact, we wrote about that in the paper you referenced as being sort of another avenue. Mm -hmm. um, to get a little more specific, because I know you asked, um, we proposed five candidate starting points as markers and responsiveness strategies. Mm -hmm in part because that's the research that we've been doing in Louise's lab or my lab or James's lab, yeah. uh, not because we felt like it was exhaustive by any means. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the most immediate examples we gave of something we weren't talking about in that paper but, but should have been and, and hope to in the future is uh, emotion-focused uh, marker-based work of, of Les Greenberg. Yeah. Um, so the candidates that we started with happened to be because we either had done research on these things and yeah. didn't know we were doing research on uh -huh. context responsiveness, <laughs> or because we were now we now had this model and we wanted to start testing it more prospectively. Um, so I can certainly I'll, I'll just list them and then maybe I can give you some yeah, examples. Yeah, I'll put it up on the screen. The the five. Oh, great. Yeah, the five ones. Yeah. And, and when yeah. I edit it, so. Uh, one thing that I found interesting in the five candidates that you chose is exactly what you said. It, it ties in with your own history as a researcher. So yeah. you are known for uh, studying expectations of the clients, for instance. And the first marker I see there is exactly this. So uh, what people yeah. bring as expectations. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I mean, this was this was born out of a... Um, when I was on internship at, at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, uh, Roger Greenberg was my one of my supervisors, and he had done a lot of research back in the 60s on expectations at a time when Jerome Frank was writing, um, Goldstein was writing. A lot of people were talking about things like placebo and expectancy. Um, and it was it was a simple conversation that we had um, where, you know, he, he asked me when I was seeing a patient, you know, uh, did you tell the patient that you thought you could help them? <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, no, but I thought I brilliantly explained my model. I thought I, you know, I thought I was very warm and empathic, uh, but no, I didn't say I think I can help. And we started talking about these sort of simple but possibly quite powerful interventions where you can actually be somewhat persuasive uh, for a person who is demoralized to help maybe give them some auxiliary hope that hopefully generalizes to their own internal hope yeah. that whatever therapy they're going to be going through um, can be useful to them. Yeah. 
And so what I had, what I did first was we, we published a, a, a literature, a, a narrative literature review, and it seemed to be that the literature was um, generally in favor of this idea that the more a patient believes that a treatment can help, the better they get. Uh, but the the older findings were somewhat mixed. Uh, the methodology wasn't always very clean. Um, and so, you know, I, we were somewhat um, limited in doing a, a sort of a narrative review as to what we could say definitively. And so two things happened simultaneously. One is uh, I was invited to do for uh, for the Norcross uh, second edition, I was invited to take the lead on, on a meta-analysis, mm -hmm. actually more systematically and empirically looking at the association between early uh, patients' expectations for change or outcome expectations, and then their sort of distal post-treatment outcome. And while, while doing that, we were also developing a more clinical manual, a module for how therapists might actually respond when people either present with or at some point develop lower expectations for change. And here you have the if-then, in a way, if it's, this happens. It's a if-then, exactly. In some ways, this was my first if-then. <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, you know, we were learning that empirically there is there does appear to be uh, if you take into account quality and you take into account, you know, file drawer, uh, you know, our, our analyses basically said there appears to be something here. The effect is not huge, um, but it appears to be relatively consistent and newer research with newer design, I think, tends to find a relationship between expectancy and outcome even more uh, consistently and more powerfully. Um, so one of my very first, well, it would have been my second, and, and I can tell you more about the first later, but my, my second clinical trial that I conducted was to actually do an additive design where we trained therapists to do CBT for depression, but then we had a second group where we trained therapists not only to do CBT, but to, in an if-then kind of way, learn to notice when patients either presented with or became uh, demoralized at some point during CBT about whether this could be helpful to them. Yeah. And then we drew on uh, our clinical experience. We drew on some of the uh, very little experimental work that exists in the literature um, about the types of things that appear to have a causal effect on having somebody's expectations go up. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, Kasdan and Krauss had published a, an, a, a, an experiment uh, in the mid 80s where they, where they showed that various things like giving a non-technical review of the research literature that supports a treatment can raise people's expectations. Um, letting people know that a treatment has a broad effect on cognition and affect and relationships as opposed to just a more circumscribed effect. That's another thing that appears to change people's expectations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, using simple hope inspiring statements, you know, like I've I've seen this before, and it's something that I've been able to treat effectively, and I think I can really help you. Yeah. Um, you as know, long as the person feels it and is remoralized from it. The, exactly. And, and, and the idea is not to just sort of put on uh, rose-colored glasses and, and see things through a, through a positive lens. The idea is to sort of give some information that might be remoralizing and at least somewhat more hopeful yeah. than this, this could never work for me. Yeah. Um, so... We, you know, internal locus of control type statements, we, 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 we packaged this all in a manual and we did a pilot study when I first arrived here at UMass. And indeed, we showed that there was an augment, you know, an additive effect uh -huh. of, layer, of layering this module on top of CBT responsively. So, you, 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 you know, when, when it looked like a patient was becoming less, um, you know, expecting to, to derive less gain from the work. CBT went on the shelf momentarily, and the therapist talked about expectations, yeah. assessed expectations, and tried to use some of these um, interventions. Okay. And, and, and so that was a, a first way of using uh, an additive design to causally, to test the causal effects of a responsive modular intervention. Yeah. And, I, and I've now done three of those. And as you might recall from the CEPI piece, I'm calling for that to be one of these types of designs where we can test responsiveness yeah. using a clinical trial. Yeah. And the clinical trial doesn't necessarily have to manipulate treatment. Uh -huh. it, or or, it, or it, it, it manipulates treatment, but only in the sense of your, uh, you're integrating something into a treatment to see whether that improves doing that traditional version of the treatment. And, 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 I'll, 
I have to make the bridge now between what you're saying and your work with motivational interviewing, of course. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the bridge. So that, that would be the third time yeah. we did these if-then things. I'll, I'll say very briefly, the first time was when I was a postdoc and I actually tested um, Louis Castonguay's uh, rupture repair notion, the idea that CBT could be improved for depression if you integrate uh, interpersonal and humanistic strategies at moments of rupture. And so for that very first additive design, um, it was very similar. CBT versus CBT uh, with uh, rupture repair strategies assimilated into it. And indeed, we found that um, the integrative group outperformed the CBT group, not only in terms of depression outcomes, but also in terms of higher patient ratings of alliance, perceived therapist empathy, and other adaptive processes. So yeah. that that kind of we, you know, Henny Wester and I then used that design uh, to test this um, this notion of uh, can we improve CBT for generalized anxiety disorder mm -hmm. um, by integrating motivational interviewing at key moments. And those key moments being uh, when a client is either uh, struggling with some ambivalence about whether to change or is being more overtly resistant to the direction that the therapist is asking him or her to take, how, or that the. How did you yeah. first get into contact and get interested in motivational interviewing? By the way, it was so interesting because uh, Henny Westra actually came to my my first presentation, um, uh, one of my first presentations on what later became this context responsive paper uh, at CEPI, uh -huh. and she just approached me afterwards and said, "This is interesting. I have this idea. I've been testing." And, and, and been interested in, in sort of motivational interviewing. And I'm also a CBT therapist who has um, faith in the model, but also some, I think there are some challenges for how it handles resistance or ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And so she really invited me into the work as, as somebody who was going to be an expert on the process research side of things. Um, so I came into this without a stake in, in MI. You know, <laughs> so in some ways it was, it, it was a nice... Um, team because it ended up being Henny Westra, who, who has a lot of allegiance to MI, Marty Anthony, who has a lot of allegiance to CBT, and then me, who had really allegiance to neither. And so in a lot of ways, we, we were able to balance each other out in terms of um, sort of researcher bias and researcher allegiance in that right. fact. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I was interested in the idea, right? <laughs> it, theoretically, it made sense to me that if somebody's being resistant, uh, you can't just keep perseverating with CBT, which is very directive and somewhat managing. Um, you have to be able to sort of do something else because it doesn't seem to work to be overly adherent. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we know that resistance has a toxic effect on outcome. We know that basic psychopathology research tells us that people with GAD are often ambivalent about their worry. They, they don't like that it's excessive yeah. and it's uncontrollable and it's interfering, but they also think that sometimes worrying keeps them responsible, keeps them on track, keeps them on top of things. And so they have some hesitancy to simply change it and get rid of it. Um, so I thought Henny's work was really brilliant, uh, this idea that um, when you notice resistance, and she's done a lot of work on, on developing um, not only coding systems, but also really more clinically observable markers for resistance, that CBT therapists can start to um, put that on the shelf momentarily and respond by using um, sort of this spirit of patient centeredness, this focus on preserving patient agency mm -hmm. and control over their own, making their own arguments for change instead of the therapist being sort of this externally motivated uh, change agent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the idea was if you, if you view resistance as an attempt for a person with GAD, who often, by the way, has problems of being overly non-assertive, uh -huh. to, to assert themselves and to have, instead of saying, no, 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 let's, let's go back and keep working on changing your thoughts, um, instead, just prize and validate that assertiveness and say, wow, it sounds like you're really having a tough time knowing whether you want to give up your worry. Maybe worry serves a very important function for you, and that must be hard. It's interesting. Right. It connects very well this part with uh, the stages of change of Prochaska and Norcross. Yeah. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And and Henny had done some pr preliminary work looking at MI as a more preparatory intervention. Yeah. This idea, it's almost like contemplators, pre-contemplators. Yeah, yeah. Getting people to the point 
uh, where they're ready to change. What I don't yeah. love about th like that language is that it, it almost says that a therapist can get somebody ready to change. Uh, I, think, I think in our latest trial, we can show that a therapist at times has to become more deferent and more submissive to the patient so that the patient can actually have a novel experience mm -hmm. of being able to assert themselves and say, you know what, I don't like what we're doing, or I don't think it's helping, yeah. or, or you're annoying me as my therapist. <laughs> Um, and, and the therapist, instead of, instead of resisting that him or herself or arguing against it, just gets alongside it. And uh, it, to use the MI language sort of rolls with that resistance and empathizes with it. Yeah, what yeah. I love about this conversation is that it's so easy then to tie in with other things. I mean, for instance, the example we just gave the client saying that this isn't helping. It ties in with ruptures. It ties in with routine outcome monitoring. So exactly. The other markers. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Ruptures, routine outcome monitoring. And then. We may not have time today, but that fifth marker that, that you'll put on the screen um, was basically based on my dissertation of the importance of, of responding to people's self-verification needs, which, which is drawn from the social psychology literature. And that entire project was developed out of my fascination with the SASB model. And I actually <laughs> I used Lorna's SASB um, Intrex questionnaire to sort of measure whether therapists were um, sort of matching in their behavior uh -huh. what patients were seeing in themselves in terms of their own introject with the idea that there needs to be some level of complementarity there, even if it's maladaptive at first, yeah. to build a relationship before there'll be enough trust in that relationship and enough perceived credibility in that relationship for a, t a patient to take a risk and to try and change their self-concept, hopefully through the therapist acting as an antidote to how important people in their lives mm -hmm. used to act. Mm -hmm. So I'll just get in a quick pitch there because that's the fifth candidate. Uh, <laughs> uh, but to go back to the MI trial, as you know, um, it was it was interesting to us that over a one year follow up period, the MI CBT patients, the the ones who got the integrative treatment, this was another one of those sort of very clean um, RCTs where the only manipulation was whether the therapist got trained to use MI responsively in moments of resistance. Um, MICBT outperformed CBT on multiple outcome indices, worry, stress, interpersonal problem reduction, all of these things went down in the, in the integrative group over a one year follow up period. Whereas in the CBT group, their gain, they did have improvements by the end of therapy, but they tended over the follow up just to kind of maintain those gains or maybe even get a little worse. Um, and so it was over the follow up period that we really saw that improvement. And to us, and what I wrote about in the newsletter, Given that the only manipulation was training therapists to engage in marker-driven responsive shifts, this additive design, I think, strongly suggests a causal benefit of doing a right thing, mm -hmm. MI, <laughs> at a right time mm -hmm. when a client is resistant. And so to me, that's how you can take research, feed it back into the CRPI model, and then when my students say, how do you do therapy? I can say, well, I can teach you a theoretical model and it's important that you have a language and a rationale. Uh -huh. I, I can also teach you, hopefully very efficiently, including therapists who've been doing it for years out in the field and want continuing education. Yeah. I can now teach you how to, or Henny even better can teach you, um, how to notice a marker for resistance and to use MI, at least so far, with very severe worry cases because they will probably show resistance or at least ambivalence. And if you do this, this will be better than just using the gold standard CBT without yeah. assimilating MI. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not that it's easy to learn these things or do them well, but it's, it's much easier to disseminate that kind of information mm -hmm. than how we've traditionally thought about dissemination where people go and go to these one week institutes to, to learn how to do a full brand, a top down models, yeah. treatment. And, and, you know, it's going to be the rare person who can kind of gather uh, the expertise or whatever we want to call it on 10, 12, 15, 20 different brand names. Yeah. But I think a very skilled, sensitive cl clinician, and, and I would bet, I don't know this yet, but I would bet one of the things that determines why some therapists are consistently better than others is probably because they can use empirically based responsiveness strategies in their work, whether they know they're doing it yeah, yet or yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that would be a determinant of therapist effects. And as you probably know, there's little research so far that tells us why certain therapists are better than others.
Yeah, uh, you know what you're saying is so exciting because it connects with, of course, practice, but also research. Now we can, in some ways, I would suggest anyone listening to us that this is a groundwork. We can now start looking for other if-then evidence-based markers and we can expand this. I think that's the great place to start, right? You know, use your clinical experience, use your clinical readings, base, base it on research findings and especially those discussion sections that say, here's where we need to go next. <laughs> And if you can identify, I mean, you could use one of these five starters because they all require more research and replication. But you could also say, you know what, I think this particular thing happens a lot clinically. Yeah. You know, whether it's somebody leaving at the end of a session, uh, you know, at, or, or waiting till five minutes to go in a session before they say something really, really powerful. Uh -huh. Right. And of course, we can use different frameworks to say that's avoidance or, you know, that's defensiveness. Um, but it also might just be a process that happens a lot, yeah. and the better the therapist can learn how to respond to it, yeah. and the more research that tells us the best way to respond to it, the better. Is it better to extend your session? Is it better to hold the frame and talk about it at the beginning of the next session? Is it better for the patient, wait for the patient to bring this up again? Yeah. I mean, these are all completely open questions, and that's just an off-the-top-of-my-head example. But I, I like the way you think about how you might build uh, a, a new if-then research program. And even in terms of uh, psychotherapy training, it could be amazing because you can re actually set out role plays just to train specific, well, deliberate practice, what Scott Miller and Al Wampold have been writing yes. about. So yes, it, it, it would be a new type of deliberate practice, right? Because, yeah. you know, I, or at least an, an adjunct to it. Yeah. Um, so in addition to watching videos, in addition to really thinking about your cases after your work, um, you know, you could also work on skills. Yeah, continue to train on these evidence-based responsiveness modules. And again, I think the society. We actually just wrote a commentary um, that will come out in the Journal of Psychotherapy Integration relatively soon to From a paper that Williams. Yeah, that she wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you know about it because you know one of the things that she's saying is in this day and age, um, people just don't really have the uh, time or the motivation or maybe the attention span, myself included, <laughs> you know, to go to these really long, elaborate theoretical institutes or trainings. And, and in some ways, because of that, this idea of clinical in-services or, or, you know, uh, trainings have just kind of gone out the window. And one of the ways that we've called for bringing them back, but in a really efficient way, is to focus on these modules. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, let's go back to the MI uh, if I if I touch on for a moment my my second design that I talked about in that paper, it's the idea of using process research, right? So uh, Adi Aviram, one of Henny Wester's students, and I uh, and Henny and Marty published a paper in JCCP recently, and we actually showed that in the CBT arm of the trial we've been talking about, just the CB the pure CBT trial, we had coders codify therapist behavior that reflected MI spirit. Yeah. So these were therapists who were not trained in MI, but just kind of naturally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. used MI spirit, empathy, evocation, uh, autonomy support. Um, and we found that even a small uh, increase in untrained MI spirit during moments that were selected because they either did or did not have patient and therapist disagreement had 10 times the influence on worry reduction than similar amounts of MI-like behavior at randomly selected times. In other words, where MI didn't really seem to be needed, yeah. right? And this suggests that, again, doing the right thing at the right time is more potent than just doing that thing, in this case, being MI-ish, at any old, <laughs> right? And this was without training. So you might imagine the potency of that if you right, did so even a 30-minute thir training on MI could really take that finding that was had a 10 times greater effect yeah. um, and, and make it a 20 times greater effect. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can really see how that's probably going to have a more, at least I can see how that's going to have a more um, sort of lasting and, and, and wide reaching uh, um, sort of benefit to our field than developing another top down treatment package that says, do this at session one, do this at session two, do this at session eight. And then, oh, by the way, take two sessions to do relapse prevention and then take one session to say goodbye. You know, all, if, if that worked out all of the time, that would be wonderful. Um, but this is saying, oh, by the way, there's going to be a time probably where with some of your cases, you start to disagree. Yeah. And, and it will be a lot more potent to do something like using MI when you disagree uh, than to just um, persevere with the 
the plan or to try something else that doesn't really have evidence behind it. Um, so, you know, that really speaks to this idea of how the, some of the implications for, uh, for training. This is this, really, you know, it's so exciting because it's all still very brand new, but you know, Michael, I, I would just like to, to finish off for this little talk with a question that I've been asking all of our colleagues and maybe we yeah. can tie in a lot of what we've been talking about. Sure. What I want to ask you is, what advice would you wish to have received when you were starting out your career as a therapist? Yeah, it's 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 great. Uh, it's a great question. You know, I think, um, you know, I think <clears throat> the advice that I, I would have wanted sort of immediately uh, is make sure you think of therapy of therapy as extremely complex, extremely unpredictable, and understand that you are probably a better therapist if you just embrace that. Yeah. Um, because I think certainly myself included as young, as young clinicians who are in training, we, we want more predictability in part because we're so invested in feeling competent and feeling like we can achieve something relatively efficiently. Um, and I think what this context responsiveness line of thought has, has given me is sort of, um, a freedom to embrace the unpredictability, a freedom to uh, be more humble and say, this is happening and, and you know what, it should happen and you know what, I probably screwed up in some ways or sometimes maybe I didn't screw up but the patient needs this. Um, and you know, it's really allowed me to think more expansively about integration. I, I think initially I thought of integration as like just blending two theories or more. Uh -huh. And, and I still think that's very important, but I think if I had gotten the advice to think of integration um, on this more modular level, mm -hmm. that would have been fantastic. But then I may have missed out on the journey to get there. <laughs> <laughs> right? it, it, it would have been great to have sure. somebody tell me that early on, but maybe in some ways not being told that early on allowed me to have some disenchantments with clinical practice and with my own work uh, that led me to think a little more sharply about um, – this uh, responsiveness notion, and then to get into these sort of additive designs, these process research designs, and then that third design, which we which we won't probably have time to talk about today, is the idea of really finding those markers. Yeah. And the way that we've been trying to do that research um, is to learn more about uh, clinicians and what they're good at and what they're not good at, and and then to use those track records as a way of being responsive right off the bat. Yeah. Right. If I know that a therapist is reliably and consistently and stably good at treating depression, but not substance abuse, yeah. and then a depression patient comes in, then that therapist could be on a short list to see uh, that patient and they would be empirically well matched. Mm -hmm. If a substance abuse patient came in and I assigned that patient to that therapist just because of pragmatics like availability, they would be empirically poorly matched and statistically likely to do um, to not do very well in that therapy. And so James, this is where James Boswell and I mm -hmm. are doing a lot of recent work. And maybe when you interview him, he can, he can jump off here because, um, we're trying to take responsiveness to, uh, almost a, a pre-treatment system wide level mm -hmm. that if we can learn what therapists are good at. And by the way, I, that's another piece of advice I would have liked. Not all therapists are created equal. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and also, however, our research tells us that most therapists are at least good at a few things. Mm -hmm. And if we can capitalize on that, we can start responsively matching patients to therapists based on an empirical track record. And we're now conducting a clinical trial, the first of its type, to really see if that matching will have a difference. And we're not manipulating therapy at all. We're saying, do whatever therapy you want. We just know that we measured you over 15 or 30 <laughs> cases and you were really good at depression. <laughs> And if we randomly assign a depression case to you now, we bet that case will do better than if they saw any old yeah. therapist. Th this topic yeah. of matching, I'm sure it will come up also when I talk to James. Yeah, yeah, he'll be happy to talk to you about it. He's he's a wealth of information on that. <laughs> Michael, yeah. I just like to thank you because I think this is like a new lifeblood for psychotherapy integration, and I can tell you personally, I'm super excited. So thanks so much for the opportunity of this talk. Absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm happy. I'm excited. You're excited. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to invite me and to uh, speak with me.